Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Well, welcome to another edition of A Reason for Hope. We're delighted you're here to join us in our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Journey we can't make without your questions on the Word of God. If you'd like to get them to us in real time, just log on to our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. You can join our comment corner. Give us a high sign that you're watching the broadcast and get the questions that are on your heart and mind regarding the Bible uh, to us uh, through that particular venue. Joined here, as usual, by my right-hand man, protege, all around good guys, Sean Richard. Sean, how else can get people get their questions to us? Well, on top of our Facebook page where you can join us again live, you can also join us by phone at one 556 1212 That is toll free and will be sent to voicemail, so you can leave the call at any time. And we will get to it as soon as we are able on the following or current broadcast. Also note that if you want to email us, questions plural, F-O-R-Hope at gmail.com is our email address. That's questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also take advantage of our other accounts on social media, the most specific of which and which will allow you to participate in seeing our smiling faces and asking your sincere and smart questions at YouTube at A Reason for Hope as well. Okay. Well, having said all of that, let's go before the Lord and commit uh, this uh gathering to him, uh, allow him to lead us into all truth. Father, thank you so much that we have this opportunity uh, this uh, evening to be able to draw close to you and to be able to hear your voice as uh, we explore your word together. Father, we pray that we would have a deeper understanding of your word, a more solid understanding, a, a confidence in your word, Lord, that will give us the ability to be able to share your truth uh, boldly in this world that is in such dire need of your light and your love and your truth. Uh, we ask, Lord, that everything that's said and all the interaction that we have would be honoring to you. Uh, Father, we pray that those who are feeling shaky in their walk with God would find comfort here. Those who are doing well would find uh, real strong encouragement to keep on keeping on. And Lord, uh, most importantly, at the end of all of this, help us to have a deeper relationship with you than we started. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Speaking of the name of Jesus, got a question on that very topic, don't we? Yes, in fact, we do. Yes. All right. I believe uh, through questions for hope. Uh, let me make sure I can find it. The question is from David. Uh, he wants to know, can you help him understand the difference of I am from when Jesus confirms his deity versus the man who says I am in John 9, 9. That's the man born blind. When they says this, the man who was born blind, he says I am. Is he claiming to be the God of the Exodus there too. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it has to do with the underlying language, and this was written in context since the Pharisees didn't get upset with the blind man when he said, I am, but hoping for some clarification. This is appropriate, and thank you for bringing it up, David, yeah. because yesterday we discussed a very common objection Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims will levy towards the idea that Jesus never right. claimed to be God. We would turn to this passage as the most emphatic, and they would just say, well, anyone can say, I am, you just did. It doesn't mean you're claiming to be God. Yeah. Well, we need to clarify not just the context around some of those sayings, but the meaning behind them as well. Yeah, if you get into it with like a Jehovah's Witness or someone that denies that uh, these I am statements have anything to do with Jesus claiming to be God, they will say, well, you know, I mean, here we do see in uh, John chapter 9, when uh, the blind man was asked, are you really the one who was born blind? He said, in fact, I am. And he uses the uh, the emphatic term, ego, a me, that we talked about there. Literally, I am, I am. Uh, and uh, that, that phrase uh, that you bring up there, David, uh, is uh, one that can, in fact, uh, be used as a point of particular emphasis. Now, there's another way of saying I am. That's the uh, verb to be, I nigh. Uh, that is also used in Greek to be able to express that. But when a person is making an emphatic point uh, about I am, and uh, normally there is, and I don't want your eyes to glaze over and feel like you're back in English class again, but uh, I am, and that I am that I am, is usually used with what's called a predicate nominative. Like, for instance, when Jesus said, I am the door, or I am the light of the world, there you have this predicate nominative that uh, modifies this I am statement. And when you have that, that emphatic 
I am that I am, or I am, I am the bread of life. I am, I am uh, the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, these things are a point of emphasis on the part of Jesus, but they aren't necessarily a claim to him being deity in that particular setting. All he is doing is setting up the stage for these particular statements, although many of these statements would point to the fact that you're dealing with Jesus' claim to be God. The interesting thing about the use of that term, I am that I am, and, and we bring it back to Genesis chapter, or I should say Exodus chapter 3 and verse 14, where uh, Moses asked that key question, who uh, shall I say sent me? And God replied, I am that I am. Tell them I am that I am has sent you. Well, here you see I am that I am uh, without that predicate nominative, without anything to modify it. It's just this incredibly strong statement of eternal being. Well, do we see Jesus using that same I am that I am uh, in that sense of not just making a, uh, a uh, emphatic point uh, that I am something, but that I am the I am that I am. Well, uh, a number of places we see Jesus do that uh, in uh, Jesus' uh, interaction uh, with uh, the uh, Pharisees uh, and his opponents in John chapter 8. Uh, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And in Greek, that's ego, a me. I am, I am. Now, notice there's no modifier afterwards. There's that, there's that lack of a predicate nominative. You're getting your English lesson for today. And uh, the people listening to him really got yeah. what he was saying uh, because they took up stones to throw at him. Uh, in other words, they got that he was claiming to be the same God who spoke to Moses at the burning bush. When uh, we see... Uh, later on in the Gospel of John, where the uh, mob led by Judas Iscariot comes to arrest Jesus. And he's, they say, uh, who are you? He, Jesus asks, who are you looking for? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, ego a me, I am that I am, not with any kind of I am that I am Jesus of Nazareth, but I am that I am. Uh, they all fall backwards uh, in his presence. Well, that's a very strong statement that Jesus is asserting something pretty radical. And, and, and by the way, it doesn't say like, oh, they were so shocked that he would utter, utter the divine name, like they'll try to explain away. They literally drew back and then fell on the ground as if someone knocked their feet from underneath them. They were bowing at their at his feet yeah. just compulsively. And why would they be shocked at that? Because that was one of the reasons they were going to arrest Jesus because he made such outlandish claims. But this is the kicker. Uh, in uh, John chapter 8, and we talked a little bit about this yesterday, but it really comes into sharper focus. We understand all of this. Uh, Jesus' statement in John chapter 8 and verse 23, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. <laughs> well, okay, that's a pretty extraordinary statement. And then in verse 24, he says, therefore I say to you, you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, now that he is inserted into the text by the translators, the New King James, to make it more fluid in English. They capitalize it with a capital H, meaning deity here, but there's no he in the original language. There's no predicate nominative afterwards that tells us that uh, this is just a modifier of, of some statement. He is saying, unless you believe I am that I am. In other words, that you're looking at the same God who met Moses at the burning bush, guess what? You will die in your sins. So that's how important it is that we understand who Jesus is and who he claimed to be. So, right. so if we're going to clarify again, make sure that you are noting the context. But if on the other hand as well, you ask, well, what does it mean even to say I am? I remember a good explanation was given when it comes to just the tense in which that phrase is supposed to be ongoing. To say I am for me as a human who's finite, I would say I am, but I just said that, therefore I was. If, yeah. I, if <laughs> God is the one who says I am, he's the only one who can be the all-existent one. This is meant to describe his eternal and absolute nature. This would be something unique from the idols of the world. Yeah, yeah. as soon as we utter that word, I am, as a human being, it's over and done in the past. As soon as anybody takes the time to hear it, we literally are saying, I was, because you're perceiving something that's already gone on. Only God can up the ante on that one. 
So, yep. All right, uh, going on to another question from Jeffrey. He wants to know, uh, how do we reconcile uh, James, and he doesn't include the chapter, but I believe, again, uh, verse 13 says, Remember when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, never does he tempt anyone else. Yet in the Lord's Prayer, or more like the disciples' prayer, uh, he says to not lead us into temptation, addressing God. So how do we reconcile these two? And then uh, another passage about uh, James being Jesus' half-brother. Okay. Um, how would you launch into that answer? As far as the relation to Jesus or the reconciliation of the two passages? Uh, the reconciliation of the two passages. Well, basically, it's, again, a matter of context. If we're asking the question, uh, did God tempt me? Well, we go off of what we do know from Scripture, not what we don't. And if we build on something that conflicts with another passage, then we either need to change direction or stop trying to at least break the wall. Yeah. If God God doesn't tempt anyone, then it would be inaccurate for me to read, say, for example, the passage in Luke where Jesus says, and our prayer should be, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Well, I guess if I'm going to say that would conflict with James, that God, as a rule, doesn't tempt anybody, but I'm, finish the passage, drawn away by my own desires and enticed, then it's my fault. But if on the other hand I say, well, the Lord's Prayer is saying that temptation is God's fault because he leads me into it, right? No, my prayer should be, and by the way, this is a prayer that Jesus prayed, so it would be one that the Father was very likely to answer. Yes, <laughs> yes. That I would not be led into temptation, but instead be delivered. That's God's priority. That's what we should be praying for, to which the answer, of course, will always be yes. Yeah. When uh, we're tempted, we're not only drawn away by our own desires, that's in James, but Paul made a similar observation in saying that everything that we deal with, nothing is overtaking you as such as is common to man, but we with the temptation comes the way of escape, of escape so right. that you may endure it. So make sure that we're reconciling not just both passages with more passages, but make sure you read the whole passage and the handling won't be too conflicting. As far as uh, passages we would turn to that would confirm James as being Jesus' half-brother, uh, this is kind of controversial among Roman Catholic circles, but not because it has to be. Why would we conclude that apart from, of course, the statements that are made in the early church? Let's just stick to the Bible. Yeah, well, in uh, Matthew chapter 13, for instance, and uh, verse 53, it says, Now, when it came to pass that Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. And when he had come to his own country, he taught in their synagogues so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where did this man get these things so that they were offended at him? But Jesus said, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now, he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, what was their beef with uh, with Jesus when he came back to his own country, that is to Nazareth. Well, of course, he had gathered a lot of attention making some outlandish claims. They had grown up with the guy, and if your big brother started claiming he was God, that would be something to beef about. Yes, I would have. Uh, I, I would either have to be absolutely sure that was true, or I'd uh, say uh, you better uh, see your doctor about the, the meds you're on. Yeah, so. so we'd also want to clarify as well in that immediate setting, uh, if he was trying to make a name for himself, he should be trying to make himself known. They thought that he was beside himself or literally insane. Uh, beside yourself is a euphemism for that uh, picture of Lord of the Rings and Gollum where he's talking to himself in the pool of water with two different personalities, yeah. saying like, man, the Josh I grew up with was not doing this? What, what's going on here? Is, is he uh, exhausted? Is he starting to lose it? What's going on? And so out of a, either a sincere desire to get him out of a situation where he'd end up in trouble or just a adamant opposition to Big Brother Josh's ministry, we can't attribute motive, but we can say that they weren't on board until after his resurrection, which is important. Well, we can actually attribute some motive because in John chapter 7, uh, we were told that uh, when his brothers said, uh, you know, why don't you go up to the big feast? Uh, no one who wants to make himself known stays here in the, the sticks. Uh, you know, if you want everybody to believe in you, go show yourself to the world. And Jesus said, you guys can uh, go on up. But then there's that sad statement, for not even his own brothers were believing in him. Yep, and yeah. that's so, important to note as well. So, you know, the fact of the matter is from Matthew chapter 13, the, the plain reading of this, uh, we've got at least four brothers of Jesus 
and uh, they're at, named and at least two sisters because, because the sisters, word sister a is of used two. <laughs> plural so uh there were at least seven kids in mary and joseph's family now you know in the scripture we are told in matthew chapter uh chapter two that uh joseph kept mary uh, a virgin until she brought forth her firstborn son. In other words, they had uh, no regular marriage relationship until after that time. And after that time, they were fruitful and multiplied just as uh, the blessing of God was on their life. So. so that would be how we reconcile that biblically. Now, the reason why Roman Catholic circles would consider that controversial isn't because the text is in question, but a tradition would say otherwise. That's unfortunately like we talked about with the I am exception or the tempt, or excuse me, the temptation exception. If this is absolutely true about God based on scripture, then I need to find another alternative or stop banging my head against the wall. Right. Now, if a Roman Catholic has an authority above or at least on par with scripture that isn't scripture, well, that's kind of a problem, but you understand at least their thought. And it comes into play here because the Roman Catholic interpretation of Matthew chapter 13 is that the phrase brothers can refer to a wide range of relatives and might have uh, referred to uh, you know, cousins. Well, that's a rather obscure take on that. I don't think if you're reading straight out of the text, you would come to the conclusion that anything else than his own brothers are being mentioned there. Uh, you know, there's a perfectly good uh, word in the original language for cousins or even more distant relatives, but, and yet we see the terms uh, brothers and sisters being used in this particular passage with the brothers being specifically mentioned. So, you know, they would say, well, maybe uh, Joseph uh, had uh, these kids from uh, another marriage. He'd be like, Step well, but wait a minute, um, you know, there's no mention uh, of any kind of uh, offspring of Joseph in any of the early accounts. Uh, and uh, they certainly weren't uh, people that Joseph uh, had with another wife after he married Mary. So uh, I think uh, the only way that you can get around all of this is not to appeal to what the scripture has to say, but uh, what a Roman Catholic would honestly say is, well, we believe that tradition is equally inspired and we believe our tradition uh, rather than just this particular passage. And in that case, when push comes to shove, tradition oversees and uh, basically overrides a clear interpretation of Scripture. So you got to be very careful of that. Yeah, we don't want to put the traditions of men as an authority over the Word of God. I think Jesus had something to say about that. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, Roman Catholics will point to a, a classic passage in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 15 about you've kept the traditions as we've given them to you. Uh, they're, you know, they then elevate the idea of traditions to being dogmas uh, that the Roman Catholic Church developed over time. Uh, not just uh, the, the scriptures themselves. Well, there are traditions, obviously, that the early church kept, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that term tradition can either refer to a tradition that actually lines up with scripture or a tradition that doesn't line up with scripture. Read Matthew chapter 15 where Jesus uh, lays out uh, the scribes and the Pharisees and Lavender for setting aside the teaching of God for the traditions of men. So some traditions are okay because they line up with Scripture. Some traditions are not okay because they contradict the clear teaching of Scripture. Therefore, tradition should never override Scripture. Rather, Scripture should always be what we, we uh, judge and evaluate uh, any kind of spiritual tradition uh, as being. All right. So. Um, another question sent along to us, and this is an interesting one uh, regarding, and this, uh, of course, is an unfortunate one, but still a necessary one. Um, the sin of suicide, the response from Scripture, of course, just don't do it. But what would the Scripture advice be to a family member who has lost someone to suicide? What would be not just the address to the person struggling with this, but those who perhaps are the secondary victims of this. Yeah, that's probably uh, one of the most uh, difficult things about someone who uh, that goes on about someone that takes their life. Uh, you know, usually when we're asked to uh, deal with this issue, when someone's going through that, uh, one of the first questions they ask is, well, where do you think my loved one is? Uh, well, there are some traditions, religious traditions, that would say that suicide is a mortal sin 
and uh, because you don't have the ability to take confession or you know, make some kind of atonement for it, uh, that you're eternally lost if you take your own life. Well, which the, again, the idea of mortal as opposed to venial sins is not in Scripture. That is an insistence or an inference on Scripture. It's a tradition, you know. And so, likewise, yeah. the idea of, well, um, if I don't confess my sin verbally, and usually they'll also add in the context of a priest confessional through the Roman Catholic traditions of the Church or any other denomination for that Orthodox, matter. Orthodox, you name it. Yeah. yeah, if you aren't in this specific format, if I forget to confess a sin, then that sin will be held against me, which is, of course, a either a mishandling of Scripture or an interpretation of Scripture that is put as the authority of men as opposed to what the passage actually says. So when someone asks that question, okay, you know, and especially if they come from a Roman Catholic background, they're usually really distraught because they think that's it and it's done and, and so on. Uh, you know, the fact of the matter is uh, the Bible tells us there's only one sin that God cannot forgive, and that is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is described in the book of Matthew chapter 12. Uh, Jesus uh, laid this out, all manner of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit uh, shall not be forgiven men. Now notice he said every sin can be forgiven. Well is suicide a sin? Yes it is a sin. It is self-murder in a sense. It is taking your life in your own hands is saying to God, God, uh, I don't trust you uh, having me here. My life circumstances are such that I'm going to decide when I depart this earth. So it is a very grave and grievous sin, not just because of the taking of a human life, but because of the aftermath and the questions that come up afterwards. But notice Jesus said that all, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit cannot be forgiven men. What's the blasphemy of the Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit is here to do a very important and significant work. In the Gospel of John, chapter 16 and verse 9, Jesus said, It is to your advantage if I go away, for if I go away, the Helper will come to you. And he, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. The main mission of the Holy Spirit in this world right now, believe it or not, it isn't to give uh, Holy Ghost goosebumps to believers or necessarily to move in spiritual gifts among uh, the, uh, the chosen. Uh, the main mission of the Holy Spirit is to convict, that is to convince beyond a shadow of a doubt, human beings of three things. Number one, that they've got a sin problem. They're separated from God. Number two, righteousness is available, that Jesus died so that uh, we can become the righteousness of God in him. And thirdly, uh, there's going to be a judgment day. And now that judgment day is going to go is based upon whether we receive God's free gift of forgiveness or not. So that's the main ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, to blaspheme is to say something uh, derogatory, disrespectful uh, toward God. And so if we reject that convicting work of the Holy Spirit, we go, well, I don't have a sin problem, I'm a good person. Uh, well, you know, Jesus is fine for you, but I think there's many ways to God. Oh, come on, you know, all roads lead to, lead to that great ocean, which is God. I'm sure it'll be fine in the end. What we're saying at that moment to the Holy Spirit is, you're a liar. You aren't telling me the truth. And that's blasphemy. That's the only sin that God can't forgive. The only sin that God can't forgive is coming to him and receiving salvation. Now, why is that so important in a situation where someone has taken their life? Well, you know, the, the question you have to explore is has that person at one time put their faith and trust in Jesus? Now, I realize there's some people out there that will say, well, no uh, believer in Christ, no one who belongs to God has eternal life in him. No, uh, I should say, no one who uh, uh, is a murderer has eternal life in him. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's true, but we also have to take the circumstances that caused this particular event to take place to happen. I, I, I've been with a number of, of families trying to pick up the pieces after all of this. And in a number of these circumstances, a very strong case can be made that that person who took their life was not in their right mind at that point. Either they were on a number of different medications, they were severely depressed, they were dealing with other forms of mental illness. And uh, we would not say that they were hitting on all cylinders as they made that decision to take their life. So, you know, the, the judge of all the earth is going to take all these things into account. 
And, you know, what I tell people is this, and, and here's the, the, the rough part uh, about someone that takes their life. When someone takes their own life in suicide, uh, the first uh, casualty of all of that is assurance. Uh, you know, we can't say beyond a shadow of a doubt, well, I'm sure you're going to see your loved one in heaven, you know, or uh, conversely, we can't say, uh, well, I'm sure because he did this, he wasn't a believer. We don't know everything that was involved. That's why I always steer people back to Genesis chapter 18 and verse 25 that says, will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Uh, you know, I try to emphasize to those people that God has done everything uh, beyond humanly possible, everything that was divinely possible to make saving people uh, possible in this world. Uh, that, he, that he personally died on the cross uh, to pay the price for our sins. And, and so, you know, when we see how committed God is in Second uh, Peter chapter 3 and uh, verse 8 and following, we are told that God is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. If there's any possible way that a person can be saved, God's bias certainly is in that direction. And, uh, you know, you just ask them, you know, do they have a uh, track record in their past of having received Jesus as their Savior? Do they have some kind of a testimony? Is there something that's gone on in their life that explains what's going on here? But the long and the short of it is this. Uh, the only thing that you can really say to somebody in that set of circumstances, put your trust in God. God always gets it right. And as we mentioned in the broadcast yesterday in Revelation chapter 15, there's a song that's going to be sung in heaven that says, true and righteous are your judgments, O God. Uh, in heaven, we're just going to be blown away because God gets it right every single possible time uh, for those who uh, live out their life to a ripe old age and die in a deathbed. Uh, for those who take their life, for those who have their life taken from them by, say, a criminal act, uh, for even those uh, that, uh, that, that die of, say, some disease. We're going to look at that and we're going to say, you know what, Lord, you were doing exactly the right thing all the way along. We won't understand that, obviously, prior to being able to see through God's eyes, but uh, such an important thing to be able to come along side people and say, you know, if someone comes along you side of you and maybe they think they're being bold and and uncompromising and so forth and uh, say something to the effect of uh, well you know i know that you know your loved one's in hell because uh you know they they were murderers and no murderer has eternal life in them uh i think that person really needs to take a step back and realize that there's one judge of all the earth and they're not him and, and so you know my my two cents worth is keep your eyes focused on the Lord, your loved one is in God's hands, and when you get there, you're going to see that God did exactly the right thing. All right. Uh, going on to a uh, cheerier topic, a uh, question from Mike who wants to know, in Isaiah 37, 36, is the angel of the Lord who killed the Assyrian army a theophany? For those who don't speak seminary, that's a, a <laughs> appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament before his incarnation, before he adopted human nature. Or is it just an angel? Uh, well, two positions, obviously, on this is yes and no. Uh, when we uh, want to find <laughs> okay. out the question as to yes. Our next the, question. No. <laughs> yeah, we want to find out if this, the question is to yes, this is a appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. People will actually just go one verse prior, and I think there's a lot of credence to that. It says in uh, Isaiah's prophecy, and it's, uh, it's a note in verse 33, the prophecy itself is preluded with, Thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. It clarifies not an arrow is going to fly into the city. He's not going to uh, invade the city. Verse 35 is how they would conclude the identity of this angel. For I will defend this city. Now who's speaking? Thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria. Right. I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now the only reason why there would be any doubt as opposed to this being obviously a theophany. People would say, oh, that should settle it. Because the problem is in the passage, it notes that the angel of the Lord went out into the camp of the Assyrians and killed 185,000 in one night. Now, as a man, that just makes me smile. But when we're told about this angel, we aren't given any further context, any further traits or details about him right. that would clarify this is indeed Jesus. When we conclude other passages as the angel of the Lord is Jesus, he does things. He says things. 
things. He's referred to as things that could only right. rightly be applied to God. In this, he just does something that could apply to God, and people would usually go to, and they should, uh, to the book of Exodus in verse or chapter 12, excuse me, and verse 29, where it says, And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord, notice not the angel of the Lord, the Lord struck all the firstborn uh, of Pharaoh who sat on his throne and the firstborn of the captives who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night, all his servants and the Egyptians. There was a great cry in Egypt for there was not one house where there was not one dead. Uh, the tenth plague, the uh, obviously overdue justice for Pharaoh doing the exact same thing to the Israelites 40 years prior or 80 years prior. Yeah. But when we're told about this situation, it doesn't name the angel of the Lord. It says the Lord personally did this. Right. Whereas in Isaiah, and note, same culture, same setting, a few centuries apart, but right. notice the same language. It says the angel of the Lord, literally Malach Yahweh. Now, when we're told about this agent, that's the key. Is this someone acting on behalf of God, or is this God acting himself? We see in Exodus chapter 12, that was God acting because it just uses his name. But when an angel acts on behalf of God, you have to ask two questions. Is this the sort of thing that an agent could do, or is this something only God could do? Say, for example, if I say, well, could an angel have... Uh, say, for instance, referred to himself as I am that I am. No, that would be blasphemous. That right. was his name for all generations, and Scripture specifies that. Uh, could an angel claim to be the creator of the heavens and the earth? No, there is no one who created the heavens and the earth apart from the true and living God. You can turn the first page to yeah. find that out. Yeah. Uh, that's unfortunately becoming complicated for some people, but I digress. If, uh, say, for example, in uh, Joshua chapter 2... Well, or is it uh, four, uh, when uh, he meets the angel of the Lord outside of the camp and says, uh, are you for us or for your, our enemies? The angel of the Lord says, neither, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, right. I have come to deliver Jericho into your hand. And Joshua, note this, bows down and worships him. Yeah. And the angel says... Take the shoes off your feet, for the ground on which you stand is holy. Boy, that sounds familiar. Yeah, right back to Exodus chapter 3. Now, yeah. we compare that as well to other appearances of angels that we know are angels because they do something quite different. In Revelation chapter 19 and in chapter 21, John the Apostle worships the angel that's showing him all of these things that await in the future. And the angel says, see that you do not do that. I am of your fellow servants of those who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Or the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. You get the point. Now, when we're talking about this angel, we're only told that it's an angel, a messenger, someone who's acting on behalf of God. Right. Can God do this? Yeah, he's done it before. Did God exclusively do this? He didn't have to. He could set an angel in agency because the right to give and take life is something that he can also do through human agents. We call that the government. Right. So there is room for another a view on this. And by the way, that is one that I take. I think this is just an angel. But those who would say, oh, this is indeed a theophany, they would just go one verse prior. And I think that's completely appropriate. Yep. But given more context, I think there's room to just say it doesn't specify. So I wouldn't be specific. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons a lot of uh, people are a little reticent to see that as the Lord himself doing it is because obviously this is Jesus himself taking people out, you know, this, this, uh, I mean, they have a hard time reconciling that with their view of Jesus. But in Revelation chapter 19, we're told that uh, when Jesus comes back, a very similar thing is going to happen, even on a larger scale. Mm -hmm. uh, we're told in verse 19, And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army, referring to Jesus. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Those two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So um, could Jesus do that? Yeah. Um, we see precedent in Exodus. Uh, we see perhaps an example of it in Isaiah. And yet we see another prediction in the future where that, uh, in fact, can happen. And so um, to quote the uh, late, great songwriter Rich Mullins, uh, our God is an awesome God. Uh, you know, he's not just 
Jesus traipsing through the daisy field with a lammy on his shoulder. Uh, when he comes back to right this world gone wrong, he's going to mean business. So, All right. Uh, here's a question I think is appropriate follow through from Sean. He wants to know, do pastors differ on any theological do subject? Do you pastors, meaning us? Uh, us specifically, um, yeah, there are a lot of uh, secondary and very minor issues in which we differ and uh, things that I've looked into and come to agree with him on, and there's others in which you've come over to my side, but when it ultimately comes down to it, it's not anything that would make us uncomfortable sitting close to each other, even with uh, COVID social distancing requirements, because we live in the same house. Yeah, and you know, the most important thing, and, and I think the overriding principle here is, uh, you know, even in Calvary Chapel circles, you know, say the uh, famous dust up that always goes on about the Nephilim, you know, and uh, it's kind of a famous, uh, almost uh, <laughs> long running joke uh, about the fact that Robert Furrow, the pastor of Calvary Tucson and I disagree about uh, who the Nephilim were and uh, who the sons of God were in Genesis chapter 6 who uh, had relations with the daughters of men. And, uh, you know, I, I will take a page uh, from uh, J. Vernon McGee, who uh, has always said about uh, someone, they say, you know, that takes a different view. Uh, they have every right to be wrong about that. But really, when, in the grand scheme of things, you know, the, the Nephilim, the identity of the Nephilim, um, doesn't jibe with other scripture. Not uh, something I'm going to divide fellowship over. I think it's an interesting thing to kick around if you want to get your, you know, theological hoo-ha on and, and uh, you know, get, get into a debate. Uh, I think it's an interesting subject. And like any other issue in scripture, uh, if we're going to take uh, a position on something that, you know, is minor, that is not one of the essentials, I think it's really important that we have good reasons and have thought through things as far as why we take the position that we take. Uh, but uh, having said that, um, you know, even uh, the issues that uh, you and I would disagree with somewhat, the main reason that we're able to be on the same page is this. We are agreed on one overwhelming principle that keeps us uh, equally yoked. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? We agree that the final decider is the Word of God. That the Word of God shared in context, in consistency, in, in a way where the main things of Scripture are the plain things of Scripture and the plain things of Scripture are the main things of Scripture. Yeah, we can disagree on some of the, the minutia for sure, uh, but uh, it's just that. It's, it's minutia. And, uh, you know, I guess it was uh, the, uh, the old saw again in uh, the essentials unity, in non-essentials uh, uh, charity, and, uh, you know, if we can have that kind of a principle. Anything beyond us, that liberty. Yeah, yeah uh, then, then we're good. So, uh, yeah, there are, there are some differences we have. I'll, I, you know, I've said before, although I have nothing but uh, the utmost respect for even Pastor Chuck Smith, there are certain takes that he would make on certain passages that I disagree with him on. Yeah, and these I'm, are the wounds I've received in the house of my friends. You would associate that with the wounds of crucifixion referring to Jesus. You would say, no, because the context is referring to a false prophet. Yeah, and, and again, a lot of Calvary Chapel pastors would take uh, a different uh, view on that. Well, uh, and uh, here's an example of something that we've even disagreed with on air. And again, I read more into it and I came over to your side and I'll give one vice versa as well. Um, this was in Daniel chapter two, where um, Nebuchadnezzar basically put out the challenge and said, no, unless you tell me the dream and its interpretation, then I'm going to literally just wipe out everyone who has your job description. And they said, well, not even the gods can tell us this. Now I took the position until that point of, well, Nebuchadnezzar couldn't recall it, but he found this as an opportunistic time to consider, you know, balancing the book, so to speak. He knew these guys were con men and yes men, and he found an opportunity to really put them to the test as far as if they were speaking from God or not. Now, you would take the position, no, he knew the answer, that's how he would able be able to identify whether the dream's interpretation was legit or not. They could identify it. You can't identify something you don't know. I had the reconciliation in my head of, well, there's times where, you know, coming into your subconscious, you forget the dream almost instantly. But if you hear it again, you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that detail. But you would present that and say, no, I think Nebuchadnezzar knew this dream because it was something very lucid. It was something given to him from God. And I went, you know what? We disagreed on that, but I see your point. 
and I've come to change my mind. Uh, likewise, we had a conversation, this is a while back, we were driving home from California, I remember, uh, in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 1, it mentions another mighty angel came down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, the rainbow on his head, his face was like the sun, feet like pillars of fire, and he had an open book in his hand, so on and so forth, uh, his right hand on the sea and on the land cried with a loud voice, and then the seven thunders uttered. Now, we aren't told what the seven thunders said. In fact, we're told explicitly, don't write that down. Well, why is that? Well, it's a good heart check. Are you here to <laughs> learn everything, or are you here to learn what you need to know? It's a good uh, doctrine check if someone says to you, oh, I figured out what the seven thunders are going to say. Yeah, find another prophecy. But no the uh, area that we uh, disagreed on and then clarified with each other was when it mentions an angel, you thought that this was a picture of Jesus and his glory. We saw similar traits when he was transfigured on the mount, his face shone like the sun and so forth. But I pointed, Or even in Daniel. Yeah, yeah, and I pointed out, well, that's great, but I understand as well, Jesus has already been introduced in his glory in this book. So if John was going to see him glorified in any other way, he'd be presented and identified as yeah. such. Yeah, yeah. If it says angel, then I think it just means angel. Angels can have traits in common with God as far as his glory, not in his attributes. Um, so, and then we talked about it and clarified with a few other passages, and you said, you know, you got a point. Yeah, you know, like the four living creatures who were worshiping before the throne, all of them reflect uh, an attribute of God, an attribute of Jesus, if you will. Not an exclusive one. Yeah, but but they but you know we see that represented there. The one who was like a man re refers to the fact that God is personal. The one who's like an ox is a picture of a sacrificial animal, the suffering servant. The one who's like an eagle refers to God's glory, his heavenly abode. Uh, the uh, the one that uh, is like a lion is the lion of the tribe of Judah, a picture of of majesty. But they are angelic beings that reflect the wisdom and the depth of the nature of God. And so, you know, when you pointed that out, I thought, well, you know, I think you're probably right. It is probably an angel sent to uh, put his foot on the land and the, the other foot on the sea and essentially say uh, God is taking back full ownership of this planet. Which would be yep. further clarified in Revelation 14. But yep. uh, notice but, but we did have, uh, you know, a bit of a difference on that. I wouldn't call that a... Uh, burn down the house, don't ever talk to me again <laughs> kind of a deal. Make the next eight hours of the drive awkward. But the point be made is look how you disagree. So long as we've established the common ground of Scripture's the final authority, then we can sort out the secondary details. And even if the details are too much to jumble, say, for example, people still differing on the timing of the rapture and so forth, uh, we're... Uh, pretty much on bar with that. But if that was to be disagreed, we could still go on calling each other Christians. I may need to find another fellowship because I disagree with too much when we refer to eschatology. But that point being made, you can disagree agreeably on very important things as long as they're not the most important things. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of important things. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Thanks so much for that, Sean. Hey, uh, our, uh, our good friend Robert uh, sent along a, an encouraging word here, and it, it does raise an important question uh, that uh, comes up here in the broadcast. He writes in our comment corner, By the way, brothers, let's give glory to God for the state of Arkansas passing an awesome bill to make abortion illegal, except in the case of saving the mother's life. Uh, small victories together make a big victory. And boy, and by the way, funny uh, fun fact about that: when we're talking about the apologetic for abortion and saying, "Well, this has to be legal because the mother's life could potentially be in danger in some pregnancies," well, guess what? Of all the abortions performed, less than a tenth of a percent are performed as a result of or involving the risk to the mother's life. So. I guess we're giving them what they want, but then we realize that isn't at all what they want. Yeah, well, uh, just uh, to bring you all up to speed, it's a great story uh, on the foxnews.com uh, 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 website. Uh, the AP story reads this, Arkansas lawmakers on Wednesday approved legislation banning nearly all abortions, sending the bill to a Republican governor who has expressed reservations about the move. The majority Republican House voted 75 to 18 for the bill, which bans all abortions except those to save the life of the mother in a medical emergency. The bill, which passed the Senate last month, does not include any exceptions for rape or incest, and that's where it gets a bit controversial. Arkansas is one of the least uh, of at least 14 states where outright abortion bans 
have been proposed this year, an effort by conservative Republicans to force the U.S. Supreme Court to visit its 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that legalized the procedure nationwide. It's time for this decision to be overturned in the Supreme Court. Now, by overturning that, that doesn't mean that abortion would be legal, uh, illegal across the land. All it would mean is that each individual state would then have the right to pass their own laws, uh, either allowing for or banning the procedure. Uh, another uh, sweeping abortion ban uh, was signed into law by South Carolina's governor last month, but was blocked by a federal judge due to a legal challenge by Planned Parenthood. No kidding. Uh, Alabama enacted a near total ban on abortions in 2019 that has been blocked because of court challenges. Governor uh, Asa Hutchinson of Arkansas, who has approved several major abortion restrictions since taking office in 2015, stopped short of saying whether he'll sign the bill and told reporters he'd make a next uh, a decision next week. Hutchinson Pray said, it's pro-life legislation and I support pro-life legislation. Uh, the governor has five days, not counting Sunday, after the bill to take action before it becomes law without his signature. Uh, the governor uh, previously said he's concerned about the ban not including rape and incest exceptions and the direct challenge to Roe v. Wade. An attorney for the National Life to Right told Hutchinson in a letter that the chances of the legislation leading to overturning Roe v. Wade are very small and remote, well, especially in light of uh, the behavior of our court, uh, Supreme Court uh, lately. Uh, National Right to Life has not taken a, a position on the bill, though its state affiliate and other anti-abortion groups in Arkansas have backed the, the legislature. Now, uh, a Democratic representative, Ashley Hudson, said, we don't have to make women in this state collateral damage simply to advance a political cause. Arkansas already has some of the strictest abortion laws in the country, and two years ago, Hutchinson signed into law a measure that would trigger an abortion ban if the Roe decision were overturned. Another law Hutchinson signed in 2019 banning abortion 18 weeks into a woman's pregnancy is on hold because of a court challenge. Abortion rights groups are, are, are prepared to challenge uh, this outright if it's enacted. Planned Parenthood called the bill the equivalent of a demand letter to the Supreme Court. So uh, the fact of the matter is this thing is going to uh, go uh, to uh, a, a series of uh, judicial challenges. But uh, the encouraging thing about all of this, Robert, and I think you point this out, is that uh, we are, first of all, seeing on an issue as crucial as being pro-life, a number of states rising up and saying, in spite of what the federal government says, we're going to have a different set of rules here, and uh, these things are going to be obviously educated in the, uh, the, the courts. Uh, but uh, the other thing that I think is really encouraging to me is, you know, we've mentioned to you about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that was signed into law by President Bill Clinton and how the uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act is being challenged by the so-called Equality Bill uh, that is uh, going through the House of Representatives and being going to be sent on to the Senate, which uh, President Joe Biden said he would sign, that would completely strip uh, all churches and Christian schools of any kind of protection under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It specifically says this in the bill uh, and would force them to be able to employ uh, to have to employ, uh, say, those who are practicing homosexuals, again, individuals who are uh, transsexuals and so forth, they would have to make accommodations in their restrooms for transsexuals to be able to use the uh, restroom of their uh, perceived gender uh, identity and uh, all kinds of things that just fly in the face of uh, our stand as Christians. It would also get into the whole idea of uh, forcing uh, uh churches to uh, accommodate uh, gay marriage ceremonies and things along these lines with the weight of the, uh, the uh, federal government behind them. Well, the uh, best response to all of this, even if something like this passes, is for individual states to reaffirm their own individual Religious Freedom Restoration Acts. And I, I mentioned the conversation I had personally uh, with Governor Doug Ducey at a gathering that he had here in Tucson a couple of years ago about whether he would stand for the Religious Freedom Restoration Act 
uh, even if it would cost, say, the state of Arizona the Super Bowl or the NCAA championships, as had happened in uh, North Carolina and some other uh, particular places that uh, took a strong stand uh, in terms of uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and uh, guaranteeing churches the right to uh, be able to practice their conscience in these areas. He uh, assured me that he was 100% behind churches, and I think the behavior that we've seen uh, the governor take in terms of the pandemic and uh, doing uh, everything possible to be able to reopen churches as quickly as possible uh, tells us uh, that he is a man of his word, and I'm I'm uh, certainly grateful that we have a person like that in office today. But I think what we're going to see are more uh, legislatures uh, on a state level making these kind of guardian steps against first of, uh, in favor of First Amendment rights, uh, including the right to uh, religious expression, freedom of speech, and so on, uh, just like we're seeing the right to life uh, being defended here. Now, whether this Arkansas ban is a bridge too far for the courts, uh, we'll let the courts shake out. But, you know, people will ask the question, well, you know, I know that you guys are very uh, pro-life uh, on uh, this broadcast, and, and unashamedly so. But what about a uh, woman who is the, uh, the, uh, uh, in a situation where she's pregnant through rape or incest? Uh, well, you know, the, the funny thing is on this program, when we, we had the capacity to be able to take live calls uh, back a couple of years ago, this subject came up. And when this subject came up, we had three different women call the broadcast on the same show, three different women on our own individual show who all had the same testimony they uh, became pregnant after a sexual assault, one of them by a close family member. Uh, they were uh, very much inclined to abort the child after they found out they were pregnant, but uh, they were believers and they prayed about it and they said, you know, I'm either going to give this baby up for adoption because, uh, you know, why should this innocent life uh, receive the death penalty for the uh, evil action that was done uh, by the, uh, I wouldn't even use the word father in this set of circumstances, the one who sexually assaulted them. So all three of them had their child, and, and all three of them uh, went on to talk about how this child that they had is just the light of their life right now. Uh, you know, full, one in the situation, full grown, just graduated from college, is just a very ex successful individual, just gotten another one, just gotten married and, and uh, was uh, starting a family of her own. Uh, and, and all of them said the same thing. I just can't even imagine what my life would be like if I didn't have this precious life in my life, in spite of the fact that the start of this life uh, started out under the most horrific circumstances. Uh, we could ever uh, imagine. So, you know, the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, when we see Arkansas making this kind of stand, uh, I can't oppose it as far as uh, scripture is concerned, as far as understanding that life really does begin at conception, as far as uh, understanding that scripture says that uh, we should never say the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. No one should receive a penalty based upon the misdeeds of their parents uh, and uh, and so for those reasons uh, you know obviously uh, an individual is going to have to make this decision and choice before before God uh, but uh, even if say for instance uh, this bill is passed in Arkansas I guarantee you here in the United States there are plenty of I guess we call them blue states that would uh, welcome and support uh, abortion for any reason for any purpose for uh, any kind of motivation from the sublime to the ridiculous and it's not like someone isn't going to be able to have this procedure uh, if they are uh, so inclined in many cases just crossing a state border uh, to uh, do something like that so uh, when someone comes up and says oh you're forcing and, and this and that and the other uh, no um, we're just uh, expecting people and they say oh it's going to cost the money well it's going to cost the life of that baby which is worse uh, so you know again I think uh, we, we see in this situation uh, a, a real note of encouragement. And Robert, uh, we sure appreciate you bringing up. Another question from Robert, I'll throw it to you here, Sean. Uh, said, in keeping step with the book of Revelation, can the book of Revelation be taken in chronological order? I take John, uh, I guess uh, I said, I take the thing, events being shown to John 
uh, but not really clear if he's being shown the past, present, or the future. So is the book of Revelation chronological, or do we jump back and forth in time in the book of Revelation? Well, I think it's a tricky issue because when you're talking about a book of prophecy, you're, by definition, speaking on behalf of God. And from his perspective, past, present, and future are kind of side details. But the good news is the book of Revelation is put in the back of the Bible for a reason. In 403 verses, there are 300 quotations, allusions, or references to an Old Testament passage that has already been explained. So, and in the rare exception, it mentions something not mentioned before. Mystery Babylon is one. The land stands and the seven stars are another and of course the issues that are explained within the chapter itself they are explained before even finishing the chapter but when it makes these statements of events taking place, you also need to notice that it's written like an Old Testament prophecy book. This is the prophecy of Isaiah written during these days and so forth. It begins the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So this is a perspective on the future. And he sent and signify it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Christ. This is the same language used to introduce every Old Testament prophet and when they identify themselves and the fact they're speaking in the name of the Lord. Right. Uh, also note that when the Lord introduces himself rather dramatically, in chapter 1 he outlines the book for us in giving us a, not chronological I will make that claim as well, but a categorical approach to the book of Revelation. Yeah, Revelation one nineteen. Yeah, yeah, this of course write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Then goes on to give an explanation of a not aforementioned symbol. Now, when we're talking about how we fit into each category, it's fairly straightforward. When you see the after these things, that implies that time has passed, that right. we're moving on from what was just read to what is now taking place. What's tricky is that there are pauses, and this is one approach among many in some circles. Uh, I dis respectfully disagree with them. That'd be another non-negotiable. But when they handle the passage and they get to Revelation 4 through 6, we're seeing a heavenly scene, then now looking down to earth and seeing the outcome of the wrath of God being poured out on the earth. And notice right. it identifies that, uh, who is able to deliver us from the wrath of the Lamb, right? Right. Now, in Revelation 7, it then says, after these things, what things? The chapter 6 things. It says, no, before the angels are allowed to really get down to business, it says, do not harm the sea, the air, or any other uh, plant until we have sealed the servants of our right. God on their foreheads. Right. Now, what is being set up here? Time out from judgment, how's the gospel going out? We see this again in Revelation 14. We see this in a pause as far as the spiritual nature of the Antichrist uh, descent to earth and the, of course, great tribulations beginning. And, of course, the alteration from the plagues to an explanation of Mystery Babylon and more detail when it comes up. So, first half of the tribulation, who's sharing the gospel? 144,000. Second half, angels. Third half, well, everyone knows the gospel. They're seeing it personified. Yeah, God bless, God bless you. you. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.